I've officially been here now six weeks. In the span of time, that is a drop in the bucket, or perhaps more accurately, a drop in the ocean. Nevertheless, I've begun to get acquainted with the congregation through meetings and visits. I'm growing in my awareness of the richness that lies in this faith community. We are a congregation with many generations. We have the new life of babies and toddlers all, to the, all the way to those deeply seasoned by life. Those who are able to be present here as well as I'm becoming aware of the many who are joining us in spirit through the radio waves and the TV through VMRC. In our society, we have named our various generations, and these may sound familiar to you. Centennials, Millennials, Generation X, Baby Boomers, and two names I wasn't as familiar with the silent generation, and the GI generation. These names are our attempt to create understanding around common themes within our age groupings. At its best, we use these categories to help build bridges between generations. And at its worst, we use these designations to justify our differences and use them to excuse us to not associate or to not communicate, to not engage with the other generation. Even though we have constructed these generational groupings, it doesn't change the fact that we have been relating intergenerationally from the beginning of humanity. In our Deuteronomy passage this morning, we heard God's teaching through Moses, instruction for a way of living as they anticipated going into the promised land. God is offering words to live by. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then the instruction of how to live these words out follow. We are to live this reality of honoring God and words and actions in all we say and do, and especially with our children, with the younger generations among us. Loving God is to be interwoven into every breath, every thought, every word, every act as we relate with each other. Our series this month, as Mariah spoke of last week, is celebrating and cultivating relationships. This morning, more specifically, around cultivating intergenerational relationships. Most of us have had relationships with people older, or younger than ourselves. I realize that we have perhaps every type of relationship represented there, represented here. From those of us that have had positive mentor, mentee, or familial relationships, to those who have experienced painful relationships fraught with discord and abuse. How we have experienced intergenerational relationships makes a difference in how we relate with others in our community of faith. I grew up in this area, but my extended family did not. My parents were transplants from the Midwest. And as my parents raised us kids, they began to have a longing for a local intergenerational relationship. And so, as a result, they intentionally began relating to an older couple in our congregation, Oli and Elsa Arbogast. 
I don't remember whether or not they ever had a direct, intentional conversation with them on doing things together, but what I do remember is that we uh, cultivated this relationship by doing numerous things together. Holidays and birthdays began to be celebrated together. We went huckleberry picking in the mountains and hollers of West Virginia. We dried apples above, in their cabin above an old wood-burning stove. And there were countless game nights intermingled. And as they grew older and it became more difficult to get around, I occasionally picked up Oli from the retirement community here, and we would go fishing together. And as Elsa's eyesight began to fail, a visit to talk about what was going on in life was most welcome. And in their later years, when our family managed to get together, Elsa requested that we would sing, Guide My Feet, before we would leave. It's only been in my adult years that I realized the significance of that relationship growing up. Jesus lived in an intergenerational community where the family expanded beyond the mother and father and even beyond the aunts and uncles, the cousins. In our Luke passage, we find Jesus, quote-unquote, lost in the temple. Mary and Joseph didn't realize until a full day's worth on foot later that Jesus wasn't with them. Now, as a parent, I could very easily look at Mary Joseph as irresponsible, but I quickly remember that the community was the family in their context. They had their families, but they also had their friends that were like family. They looked after each other. They entrusted their children into each other's care. They also trusted their 12-year-old son to do as he was told so that when it was time to leave, he was to follow. And we may be reminded, too, that Jesus in this time was growing into his identity as God's son. But he was also acting age-appropriate, beginning to assert his opinion and will and this sense of identity, this independence. And so here we see a dynamic movement another way. Not only the parents attempting to form and teach a child, but a child forming and teaching a parent. I have heard other parents express that it's the hardest job that they have ever had. I would also add humbling. I have been at my best and my worst with my kids. I have learned much about myself and will continue to learn. I am being formed by my children and the younger generations among us. Marlene Frankenfield, a friend in eastern Pennsylvania, is a spiritual director and former youth minister at Doc Mennonite Academy and Franconia Conference. She was interviewed by the editor of the Mennonite back in 2016 about her call to youth ministry. She recounts, it's really an amazing story. I feel like I didn't choose you as ministry, it kind of chose me. I think it's really God's sense of humor. She shared that she was in a low part in life, influenced by family stress and faith that was trying to grapple with the complexities. The purpose of their family attending church at the time was so that their children could go to Sunday school. And so during the Sunday school hour, she would find herself going out the front doors and sitting down on the sidewalk and waiting for them. Now the youth at their church had their Sunday school meeting in uh, a building 
outside across the parking lot. And so the youth would walk by her and say hi and sometimes stop to talk. The youth, as they continued to do this, began to talk and really open up to Marlene. And she began to notice that life in those moments, in those conversations, wasn't so heavy. In fact, it was fun. And so began her journey to being invited to be a youth sponsor and eventually a youth pastor. So when her story of call comes up, Marlene talks about God calling her through those teenagers. I believe these stories and scriptures testify to our need for all generations to be in relationship with each other. Paul uses the image of the body in 1 Corinthians 12, which I would also like to read, with not just the different gifts in mind, but also different ages, different generations. So I'll read portions of chapter 12 from the message. Your body has many parts, limbs, organs, cells, but no matter how many parts you can name, you're still one body. The old labels we once used to identify ourselves, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and I will add young or old, are no longer useful. We need something larger, more comprehensive. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If Foote said, I'm not elegant like hand embellished with rings. I guess I don't belong to this body. Would that make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, limpid and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where God wanted it. But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown, out, blown up into self-importance. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body. It would be a monster. What we have is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is important on its own. Can you imagine eye telling hand, Get lost, I don't need you, or head telling foot, you're fired, your job has been phased out. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is, without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion over full-bodied hair? The way God designed our bodies is a model for understanding our lives together as a church. Every part dependent on every other part. The parts we mention and the parts we don't. The parts we see and the parts we don't. If one part hurts, 
every other part is involved in the hurt and in the healing. If one part flourishes, every other part enters into the exuberance. You are Christ's body. That's who you are. You must never forget this. Only as you accept your part of that body does your part mean anything. Paul has reminded us here, we all are a necessary part of the body. If we would cut off any generation, centennials, millennials, genera Generation X, baby boomers, silent generation, the GI generation, we are missing something. As we lean into each other, engaging and opening ourselves up to relationship, we grow ever deeper into realizing each other's significance and our own significance. I have been focusing my time thus far on visitation with old, the older generation that we have among us here in Parkview, whether they're able to attend or are homebound. And if you consider yourself in this category, and I haven't visited, I'm working my way around, and if you would like a call or a visit sooner rather than later, please let me know. And I should say anyone else, for that matter, you don't have to consider yourself a part of the older generation. That said, I've been hearing many stories of deep faith and resilience. And one experience that has struck me is in this time is that during the time frame during the years when the conscientious objector status was not official. World Wars I and II challenged the youth and young adults when it came to military service. They were being told it was their turn to fight in the war, which conflicted with their deep conviction of living a life of nonviolence. Some of our members had their faith tested, and perhaps you have family members and hold their stories dear to how they were tested, experiencing persecution and ridicule. It was out of this experience that uh, experiences like the cattle boats, 1W, CPS, and eventually voluntary service became organized places where young people could serve. The generation that experienced this in intensity of societal, pressure, societal pressures to serve in the military that was counter to their Anabaptist theology can perhaps teach us something to us today as we continue to face societal pressures to live certain ways. We may not be facing the same pressure to serve in the military. However, I would venture to say that we are facing the pressure more on our individual survival than on our communal well-being. Individual financial security can consume us more than our relational needs with each other. Self-preservation can consume us more than the honest truth-telling, transformation, and work towards reconciliation. Fear, anxiety, and a feeling of irrelevance can consume us, causing us to close down, further isolating ourselves from the other. We are one body, each generation an important part of the whole. When a generation passes on, we are impacted by their absence. We have to rely on the stories, on the memory of our stories, and sometimes on the books. But the books sometimes miss some elements, some important elements. Likewise, when we tune out 
a younger generation because their wisdom doesn't quite match ours. We cut ourselves off from the potential of hearing God's invitation, God's call for us as a community. The same goes when one generation is hurting. Every other part hurts, whether we realize it or not. We are experiencing this as we engage with the world around us. The last number of weeks have been turbulent for those of us who either have experienced or walk alongside someone who has experienced sexual assault or abuse. There is deep pain, broken trust, rage, and lament. How we have experienced intergenerational relationships affects how we relate with each other in community as well. We are not immune to brokenness and pain. We hurt together. At our best, we can use these intergenerational relationships to foster healing and hope through God's grace and love. At our worst, we silence the pain in hopes that it will go away. Pain and hurt are very hard to bring forward. They, ca they carry the power of shame and guilt. But as long as the pain remains, the body hurts. So we continue to learn as a faith community what it means to be a healing community. I hope that we can be a, a part of the healing by remaining engaged in relationship with God and each other. I hope that if we, it, I hope that if we live honoring and loving God with our heart and our soul and our mind, our might, we can live into God's transformation both individually and corporately. I hope that in providing safe places to gather, we may be vulnerable enough to be held in God's care so that we may grow from woundedness to wounded healer. This fall there have been and will continue to be, including today after the service, have conversations reflecting on how we are cultivating relationships together. At our church retreat, we began hearing how intergenerational relationships have been an important part of cultivating relationships, cultivating community, a sense of community within this faith body. How can we continue to nurture these relationships? We are a large congregation, and these kinds of relationships can be harder to nurture because we don't know everyone. And it can feel uncomfortable to approach somebody younger than yourself or older than yourself when you're, you haven't met them officially before. And so it can feel bold to go up to somebody you don't know and say, hi, my name is Paula. I haven't met you yet, but I'm glad you're here. I, but somebody younger than myself, I remember enjoying singing in church at your age. What do you enjoy about church? Or one of my favorite things about this season of fall is the changing of the colors. What is one of your favorite things? Yes, this may feel bold, but it is a practice we need to do. There are so many ways that we can engage with each other, but it isn't going to happen without some intentionality, and especially without valuing the richness of diversity among us. 
So may we have the courage to step out of our comfortable social circles to engage each other. May we have the wisdom to know how to engage with sensitivity to our varied experiences. And may we be enriched by the relationships that we share together. <laughs>